I'm really delighted to be here. Um, it's really interesting to talk to quite a mixed group. I understand that we have some speech and language therapists, some parents, some autistic adults, some clinicians, some researchers, and so on. So, um, and as Liz mentioned, the, the goal of my work now really is to do some some research that has very strongly applied consequences. So it's always interesting to be able to talk to people about the work in that context and get feedback on whether I'm, I'm fulfilling that goal to, to do things which are of relevance to the community. Um, there's a couple of things that I should flag up before I go too far through what I'm going to talk to you about today. One is that I have a conflict of interest, which is that I developed with colleagues an iPad app called Find Me, which is now available for download from iTunes. Um, you can get a free version of it, but there's also a paid kind of pro version of the app. And um, if that gets downloaded and paid for by enough people, then I could get a royalty payment. Um, it seems pretty unlikely as things stand, I have to say. The free version is going like crazy, but uh, <laughs> $7.99 is just too much. Um, so, uh, but it's important to declare that because, of course, that reduces my ability to be um, objective in the research that I'm doing or could potentially. Um, uh, I'm also just going to sort of flag up right from the beginning that my research has a bias towards working with young children with autism and their parents. And in particular, because I developed an iPad app, I know a lot more about apps for iPads and iPhones than I do about other forms of technology. So I'll mostly be talking about that kind of population, that age group. I say young children, I'm talking about maybe under eight years old. Um, but I'm, I'll try and make connections throughout the talk um, that will help make those um, findings and that information more relevant to other groups as well. So thinking about the kinds of principles that we could use when we're choosing technologies to use with people with autism that would perhaps apply across different age ranges, things like that. Um, please ask me questions at the end, um, or if you have a burning question halfway through, pop your hand up about you know, other populations or other forms of technology if you would like to. Um, I'm also going to say something quickly about language. So, um, you know, traditionally, or, or at least in recent years, we've been using person-first language when we're talking about children with autism and adults with autism and so on. However, there's very strong perspective now in the autism community that many adults and adolescents prefer to be referred to as autistic adults or autistics um, or autistic people. Um, so in an effort to balance those two perspectives, I will hop randomly uh, between using person-first language and non-person-first language. And um, I hope that the person-first attitude that I hold towards the autism community will, will come out no matter what the technical terms are that I'm using. Okay, so this is just a slide to try and illustrate um, the ubiquity of technology in our lives today. And all of these are kind of relevant when we're thinking about the autism community as well. So um, some of these are slides from specific autism studies. This is um, a young boy working with the NOW robot, which is a French developed robot, um, uh, who is his therapeutic partner in an ABA setting. Um, uh, this is a young boy with autism uh, using an iPad app. But there are other mainstream technologies, um, so things like Second Life, online virtual worlds and virtual communities can be very popular um, among autistic adults. And I've got some examples here, for example, of how technology can be used to support an ageing population. So these are some guys um, bowling using a Wii. And of course, um, we have really for the first time now an ageing population of, of people with autism, and we need to be thinking about supporting them. Um, this is a theme I'll come back to, but these are just some examples, Facebook and Twitter, of the way in which our social lives are increasingly mediated through technology. And of course, um, when we're thinking about autism, which is principally characterised by challenges with um, social interactions, then thinking about how technology is now a social medium is particularly interesting. So, the outline of the talk, um, I'll just mention a little bit about why I think we should be using technology um, to support people with autism. Um, I'll, do, I'll talk about a kind of case study of my own piece of research for a project called Click East, which is developing the app I mentioned earlier and then running a randomised control trial to evaluate whether it was any good. So that's kind of my credentials, you know, why I'm allowed to stand up here and tell you all about technology. Uh, it's because I've done that project, I guess. 
then I'll try and move on to some quite practical recommendations um, about technology and about managing technology use. There are a lot of concerns around you know, the presence of repetitive and obsessive behaviours among people with autism that might come to the fore when you're thinking about using technology and finish with some kind of tips of what to look for in good technology for autism and then questions at the end. I'll try and keep it to about 45 minutes, um, uh, certainly under an hour, and then we can all go and have our biscuits, <laughs> which is why you're all here, really, of course. Um, so this is just a couple of quotes from one of the earliest papers that I'm aware of uh, for a study that used technology to explore how um, uh, children with autism could be encouraged to learn new skills, in this case, learning kind of letter recognition, word recognition, spelling, and so on. And there's just two quotes that I've highlighted here that I think are really interesting. One is that parents of children taking part are encouraged to expose them daily to television. Um, it's hilarious because uh, there's a sort of um, assumption there that they might not be being exposed daily to television anyway, <laughs> which of course everyone today is. But also, um, you know, this encouragement of exposure to TV is quite, is quite extraordinary in the context of our modern view of television as potentially being a kind of damaging influence in development. And I'll come back to whether I think that's true or not. Um, another very important point, so Colby says that few people in the world have access to the million dollar computers required for this work. Um, he was at Stanford University, I think, you know, and he had these kids coming in with autism to use computers that were connected up to an entire room full of, you know, computing hardware next door. And now we can take um, something like this out to schools and do infinitely more powerful things. So we're in a real golden age of technology and it's a very exciting uh, time to be working in. So what's the evidence? Um, there are plenty of survey studies that suggest that children and adults with autism are heavy users of technology. Um, experimental studies mostly employ technologies to look at educational outcomes. So still, going back to that original Colby study, looking at things like word or letter recognition and so on. And those studies really fairly overwhelmingly report improvements in target skills, but also in some more interesting spin-off skills so thinking about um, concentration and on-task behaviour during computerised lessons and increases in spontaneous communication during computerised lessons in schools. There are systematic reviews to support the, this, um, this idea that there are benefits to working with technologies and there's a recent one specifically looking at touchscreen technologies, so iPods, iPads and so on. However, generalisation is limited. So a big challenge in all of this research is that um, if a child learns a skill in a technological environment, learns it on a computer game or a computer program, does it actually translate into a difference in terms of their real world behaviour? And that's, that's not always the case. I should also note, however, that there's a similar pattern in a lot of um, autism education and intervention <coughs> programmes where, for example, children with autism will show development in a skill when working with their therapist but then when you evaluate how they're interacting with their parents, the skill doesn't come out. So there is more general problem with generalisation. Um, so it's not necessarily fair to point the finger at technology as the culprit here. Some of the strengths of technology. So because people with autism, uh, and it's a generalisation, but it's a fairly accurate one. Because people with autism tend to be quite skilled at using technology and have quite a strong kind of preference for using technology, there's an opportunity to use that strength to scaffold weaknesses in other areas. So it can be very instinctive solution for autistic people, it can be very motivating and engaging, it allows you quite easily to present a personalised learning environment. In addition, technology is part of our social world, it's there, we're all using it, so therefore it should automatically be available to all members of our community. Touchscreen technologies, particularly larger touchscreens like iPads, mean that we can start to provide technological approaches when working with very young children in a way that was previously closed because most technology would need to be accessed using keyboard presses or using a mouse and that's, you know, that's beyond the skills of your average three or four year old. And in addition, people with autism are not waiting for some official endorsement. They're not waiting for their clinician or their parent or their local research team to say, go on, you should use technology. 
they're, they're early adopters. They're out there, streets ahead of everyone else. You know, they're driving a lot of technological development. I've got an image here that just um, characterizes this idea of using a strength to scaffold a weakness. So not all of us are particularly good at delivering exotic chat-up lines off the cuff in cocktail bars and wooing our desired partner. <coughs> um, so what do we do? We do online dating where you can get a photo of yourself looking your absolute best, where you can present yourself in a, a witty and charming manner, and you can spend ages adjusting your profile to make it perfect. So we're all doing this. We're all using technology to help us out in areas where we're otherwise struggling. And it's the same principle. I'll just um, present here some data from a survey study that I'm actually doing at the moment. So this was an interim analysis when we had about 125 responses from parents of children with autism, and, and that's children of all ages. But because the survey was directed at parents, there's a sort of implicit assumption that these are parents who are choosing technologies on behalf of their child. So I think the oldest child in the study was 32 years old. Um, but living at home and minimally, minimally verbal. So that's the kind of population that we're talking about, mostly much younger children. Anyway, you can see that parents of kids with autism are massive technology adopters. Out of a sample of 125 who responded to this survey, more than 100 of them had some kind of tablet. The survey is advertised as a technology and autism survey, so we could have some bias here. But still, there's a huge amount of use of technology. Um, that technology is being used... Um, the biggest uh, kind of quadrant of this is um, games and followed by watching YouTube. And I did some interviews to back this up and what the, there's a very consistent pattern that parents are saying that what their children want to watch on YouTube are videos of other people playing the games that they like so that they can get, then go and play the games and do better. So about 50% is basically gaming or getting better at gaming by watching things on YouTube. Um, there's a fairly small slice of the pie devoted to social media. So it's this blue one here. So that's things like Facebook or Twitter or MySpace or the more recent versions of those that I don't know what they are. Um, however, I don't think we should get carried away about the size of this slice because, as I say, a huge number of the children in this survey will have been preschools or primary school age kids who we wouldn't expect to be going on Facebook or whatever anyway. Um, and when the survey's completed, I'll be breaking down the data to look at that. And then this is the final slide from that survey study. So this is just to represent the kind of positive attitudes of, of um, parents in this study. So all of the blue bars represent a kind of positive attitude to things. So just to highlight, parents think that technology does make their life easier, and overwhelmingly they think that their children are benefiting from using technology and have learned new skills in using technology. Um, this is modified as slightly. So these green bars, these are negative responses, by which I mean responses that represent a negative attitude rather than the word no. Um, so these are responses that suggest that people are worried about their child becoming obsessed, and they're worried about how much time their children spend on technology. What I think is really interesting here and, and needs to be delved into is whether those worries are driven by what the child is actually doing. Does the child show evidence of being obsessed or using too much te technology? Or are they driven by what our society tells parents they should be worrying about? So I'm a parent of young children myself. And uh, you, know, you do feel sort of bombarded with guidance on screen time and things like that that can be slightly overwhelming. OK. So I think the original title of the talk was Intervention, Communication, Education and Fun or something like that. So this is the intervention part. This is a kind of case study of my own project looking at using technology in an intervention context. And the project was called Click East for reasons that are lost in the mist of time. I can't remember. Um, so the background to this um, is thinking about the development of social attention. So this is a key skill in child development and one that does not come naturally to most kids with autism. And social attention can be broken down into subcomponents which include things like looking at social stuff. So in this picture, you have a little person dangling there and even though they're a teeny tiny part of that beautiful landscape, they're receiving an inordinately large proportion of our attention. We're kind of drawn to look at that person, that social information. 
And that happens from a very, very young age. Later on, we start to use social cues to a direct our attention. So if someone is looking and pointing at something, we follow those cues. And shortly after that, we start to provide our own social cues by looking at pointing at things ourselves. And that's a developmental progression that's fairly standard in typical development and very often um, delayed or, or, or otherwise atypical among kids with autism. And it's particularly important because these social attention skills provide a foundation for, for more developed social and communication skills, particularly things like learning language. So if I'm standing here with my little boy saying, look, look at the plane, look at the plane, Jimmy, and he's not following that triangulation, then how is he going to take the object plane and, and attach it onto the word plane, right? Okay. So the goals of our project were to create a functioning technology-based way to deliver an intervention in this area. And we called it a top-up intervention. We're not looking to replace the input that people get, the interpersonal um, uh, therapeutic approaches that are so valuable to kids, but we're looking to find a way to provide, a, a, as I say, a top-up for those. We wanted to look at whether that could have an impact on real-world social communicative skills. And we also wanted to think about some other things um, that perhaps aren't often foregrounded in intervention studies. So thinking about value for money and feasibility, well-being for the whole family, and making the intervention immediately and widely available. So we developed this app, um, and it, it's, it follows a kind of standard game structure. It gets more complicated as you go through. So you start off with just a little person in a scene, and if you tap the person, you collect a token. As you go through the game, the scenes sort of start to fill up with interesting stuff. Um, and the interesting stuff does interesting stuff. So the birds fly backwards and forwards. Some of the animals hop about. If you tap the lion, he'll roar. Um, uh, I don't think the giraffe makes a noise because we couldn't really find a noise for a giraffe. Um, but they will do things like... Um, the other thing you get is you get a, a voice, actually my voice, because we couldn't afford an actress. So you get a voice saying... <laughs> Lion, just like that, or <laughs> giraffe, <laughs> my, my best teacher voice. Um, so those things are all interactive and they're fun, but the right answer is to tap the person. And there's no instructions for that. It's just implicitly sort of bound into the game. When you tap the person, you collect a little token. The token appears in the bottom left hand, or bottom right hand corner of the screen, left hand, whatever, um, bottom corner, and, uh, and you move on to the next screen, okay? In the second part of the game, it's about following social cues. It starts off trivially easy because there's only one target object on the screen and the character is looking and pointing at that object. But it, again, as you go through, it gets more complicated, so targets start to appear all around the screen. And finally, the character starts just looking at the target but isn't pointing as well. So there's a reduction in the kind of um, scaffolding from those social cues. And it's the same as before. If you tap one of the distractor objects, you might get a little kind of revving engine noise or you might get car. Um, but only the target object is the correct answer. Only that will collect you a token and move you on to the next scene. Um, when you've got five tokens in the bottom corner here, you then get a little animation as a reward. And there are three different reward settings that children can choose with the help of their parents in the menu. One of them is some sort of spinning shapes. It's very abstract and sensory. Um, one of them is some jumping acrobats to the sound of applause. And one of them is a train, obviously. Got to have a train. Um, this is the design of the study. I won't go into it in detail. Suffice to say, it was very well designed. Um, the important thing to highlight in blue here is that we use this parent-child play measure as our primary outcome. So this is an in-development measure that's being made by Cathy Lord, who developed the ADOS, which is a big diagnostic assessment that's used um, with people with autism. And um, she's trying to take the principles of the ADOS but apply them to a, a kind of more relaxed setting. So what you do is you give the parent and child a, a fixed set of toys and they play for about 10 minutes and then you watch the video back later and you code it for the presence of certain behaviours on the part of the child, sort of social communicative behaviours. And the reason I want to emphasise this is that we were setting ourselves a terribly high bar. So we're looking for 
playing an app and they get the app to take home for two months and uh, then they come we get a few um, bits of data by telephone and by post but they don't come back again until six months after they first came in so that's four months after they finished the assessment that's when they do their parent-child play so we want the children to they've got a baseline level of of kind of social skills that they show when playing with their mum or their dad. They play the app for two months, then for four months we leave them alone doing nothing, then they come in and they do their parent-child play again and that's where we're looking for a key difference. So it is a, it's a very high bar to set um, in terms of assessment. Again, I don't want to talk about this too much, but the groups were really well matched. Um, there were 54 children in the study altogether, 27 in each of the groups, and there was a random assignment procedure to the two groups. Um, okay, so now some data. So this is our primary outcome measure. Um, it's, a, it's a summary uh, score um, based on the difference between and each individual's child score at baseline and six months later. And the bigger the change, the, the bigger their improvement or the, their reduction in kind of autism type symptoms. So it looks very exciting, but it's a non significant difference, unfortunately. Um, we took all sorts of other measures. Um, so this is based on their ADOS social affect score. So that's the diagnostic assessment. It's not such a good assessment because it's designed for diagnosis, but not to capture subtle changes over time. And as you can see, there's no difference between the groups. Um, we also looked at some scores immediately after the intervention finished. So this is a language score. And um, this one is a parent questionnaire, um, a social communication, um, sorry, a communication and symbolic behaviour scale. So that's, again, kind of um, classic autism type behaviours being measured here. Um, this one, again, it looks exciting, but there's no difference. And in particular, because it's a parent report measure and the parents all knew whether their child had had the intervention or not, there's a potential for bias in there. So no significant results. Put the iPad in the bin, give up, go home, it's terrible. No, we thought, oh, we must be able to find something more exciting. And we did, a little bit. Um, so what we did was look at individual change scores. So... Um, was there a subset of children who were showing a benefit, even if as a whole group they didn't show a benefit? And we found five children, so we, we defined reliable change according to the statistical formula, which is basically, you know, if you saw the same child every day for two weeks and did the same test, you would get ups and downs and ups and downs in their scores on that particular assessment. So we define change in such a way that, that the difference is big enough that it's really unlikely to have occurred just by chance. And we found five children in the intervention group. There's actually five lines here, but one of them's sort of hidden behind this one. Five children in the intervention group who showed that really significant, reliable change, and only one child in the, uh, in the control group who didn't. Um, we also found that those five children, you can see they're all starting up quite high up here. They've all got fairly poor social communication abilities at the beginning. And in particular, we found that their joint attention skills were pretty poor. And that's really exciting because that's what we were trying to address with our app. So um, there's some potential there that it could be that there's a subset of children who start off with a specific difficulty in the target area who can have that improved um, by working with an iPad app. What we haven't done yet is explore the data recorded by the app as well. So the app records all sorts of things within itself about the detailed kind of learning progress of the children. And that might also have some impact. But you'll remember we didn't just want to look at um, outcomes. We wanted to look at some other things like well-being. So I won't read these out loud to you, but the parents felt very positive about the intervention and about the experience of having an iPad to take home. I should say we locked it down so it just had our, our app on. These weren't parents who were enjoying it because they were on Twitter all day or, you know, Facebooking or whatever. It only had one function. It was only there for the child to play this one game. But so many parents said, you know, he's never sat down for more than 30 seconds and played with a toy for, this, for that period of time. And these kids were sitting down and playing with the same thing for 10 minutes. And their parents were going and, and making, possibly even drinking a cup of tea. Very exciting. 
So thinking back to some of our goals of the study, I think we did create a functioning technology-based intervention. Children engaged with it. 75% of children reached the highest level of the game. And um, so that was 22 children in the intervention, no, 23 children in the intervention group. 22 of them immediately started again from the beginning and played it the whole way through. Um, at least once more time, one more time. We didn't have an impact on real world social communicative skills. Um, we might have had an impact for a subset of the group who were characterized in a particular way, and that is interesting to explore. But I certainly can't overstate um, the, the impact on real world skills. We did provide value for money in intervention delivery, even though technology is thought of as an expensive thing. Actually, when you look at the cost per hour of delivering our intervention, it was about the same as a therapist would cost, but that's based over only a two-month period and a single app. If you gave a child with autism an iPad for a year that was loaded up with, you know, half a dozen or a dozen potentially beneficial apps, then it starts to look very, very cost effective indeed, even if the, the effects on behavior are, are quite modest. We had really good impact on well-being for the family, and we made the intervention immediately, immediately and widely available by licensing the app to a commercial software developer who put it on iTunes. And the free version has been downloaded by 90,000 people. Um, that's very exciting because thinking back to that subgroup of five kids who showed a benefit, so that's about 19% of the sample, and 19% of the 90,000 kids who've downloaded the app is, you know, over, over 15,000 kids or something. <laughs> I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying there's 15,000 kids out there walking around, you know, kind of magically better thanks to our app, but the, as I say, the, the modest intervention effects when you start to have that global reach become very exciting. Okay, so what are we going to do next? Um, we want to think about the iPad as a platform for multiple intervention delivery, so all we had was this one game on there, um, but actually you can do all sorts of things with an iPad, which I'll come back to, so looking at aided and augmented communication or picture exchange communication systems, both of which can be delivered on an iPad, traditional educational contact like content like literacy and numeracy apps, as well as social communication skills. In particular, we want to work more closely with um, kind of behavioral intervention providers to ensure complementary content. So I think this is really where um, technology has a future, is in um, working very closely with speech and language therapists and so on to see if we can take the relatively small number of hours that they are able to spend with clients and provide supplementary materials to kind of fill the gaps in between. And then I like to think in a more elaborate way about the effect of access to things like iPads on family well-being and independence. So, you know, parents who were able to go to their cousin's wedding because they could take the iPad with them and they knew that their son would sit still and play the game quietly and they wouldn't, you know, run riots all over the wedding, that sort of thing. And, you know, those effects are really important. Okay, so um, now I move on to uh, some slightly more kind of practical recommendations, having shown off a little bit about my own research. Um, so thinking about what we can use technology for, thinking about some of the other elements in my title, communication, education, and fun. Um, so one of the things I want to flag up up front is this, this issue of kind of peer respect. So, you know, think about carrying around a ring binder with all your PEX symbols in versus um, sticking something with the Grace app in your pocket. So um, for those young people who are coming up to secondary school or late primary school, but still minimally verbal and still very reliant on PEX, but such that they now have a vocabulary of, you know, hundreds of different PEX, this is a, a really fantastic solution and a very practical solution. Um, so peer respect is one. Normality is another. You know, everyone else is on a phone, and I'm on my phone too. Great. I'm fitting in. Um, Self-expression. There are a lot of wonderful apps out here. This is one called Reacticles. It was developed by a colleague of mine, Wendy Keybright, who's at Cardiff University. It's absolutely beautiful. It's free. Um, you can download it for iPad, and you can also download it for free for use with a webcam. So you just sort of stand in front of your computer screen doing this, and it makes these beautiful patterns all over the screen. Um, technology is great for peace and quiet. This is my younger daughter watching a slideshow of photos of herself, which is basically her favourite thing to do, <laughs> um, and gives me time to cook supper. 
Um, play skills and concentration, I mentioned this earlier. So children who drift from toy to toy, who, who don't engage with toys, perhaps because of the imaginative um, requirements needed to really um, get involved with them, can be really inspired by playing with technology. And then family flexibility. So, you know, a device where you have all of these useful things that you can stick in your back pocket. Um, this is a plug for my own website. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, <laughs> well, it might be useful. So I do the, this is one of my app reviews. I do these app reviews, and this is the basis of the next part of the talk. So I, I look at apps, and I review them from a kind of expert, in inverted commas, perspective. Obviously, as a researcher, um, rather than as a parent of someone with autism or, or as an autistic adult myself. And I have ratings based on the kind of quality of the app, so look and feel, accessibility, how fun is it? But also some more, some ratings which are, are perhaps more specific to autism. So how much do I think this is an autism-specific app? Do I think it's got learning potential? Is there any evidence base for it? Particularly when there are apps that are making therapeutic claims but don't necessarily have an evidence base. And then sometimes I do these snazzy reviews where you've got lots of different apps that are supposed to do the same thing and I try and work out which one's the best. Um, and you can't really work it out, but you know you can sort of make recommendations. This might be particularly good for kids. This might be particularly good for adults. And all of this has resulted in my first ever app wheel. So um, divided into different kind of topic areas, um, and, and you can kind of feed out so within education, all around education, general knowledge, literacy, life skills, and then specific apps for those things, and then the names of the apps down here. Um, so you can go and kind of get them if you want to. Um, so apps for intervention. What's good about this? Um, you can deliver a lot of different approaches in one device. Um, there's an opportunity to learn through repetition, which is probably a kind of instinctive learning style for people with autism. And then these apps often have a recording and monitoring capacity. So as a parent or as a therapist, you can keep track of what um, the young person is doing with the app. This is also a negative, though, recording and monitoring. I mean, I, I'm not sure if your average parent of a, of a kid with autism really needs um, more sort of nagging about milestones and goals and achievements and so on. I, I think some parents are really reassured by that level of detail, but it can also have a detrimental effect because you start to be sort of obsessed about the rate at which your child's making progress. And what I've mentioned earlier, which is that any learning from technology won't necessarily generalise. So I think we need to take care when selecting technologies for intervention that they are complementary to the other um, things that are being done with that child or young person. Some examples of what I broadly called intervention apps. So this is Storymaker up here. It's a very, very good social stories app. I think this is something where um, tablets, iPhones... Uh, iPads, whatever, really have something to add because you can have a single device and you're carrying around a huge library of social stories to be produced at the moment that they're needed. Um, you know, this is what I do when the bus is late and you're there at the bus stop and you've got your social story in your pocket. Um, you can also make those social stories within the app and then save them with the app. So you, there's not any of that sort of printing and laminating and hole punching and putting into ring binders that people were doing previously. Um, the other thing about Storymaker is that it's been made in partnership with Carol Gray, who developed Social Stories originally, and it has some wonderful tutorials built into it. These are a couple of screenshots from an app called ChoiceWorks, which is excellent for kind of scheduling, so you can build these schedules. This is someone's nighttime schedule. I have to have my dinner, I have to have a bath, I put my pyjamas on, I brush my teeth, and then I go to bed. And each time you drag and drop across to signify that you've completed the activity. And then as a reward, you can have a story or listen to some music. Um, and this is a waiting board from the same app. I'm still hoping that they're going to update this to a visual clock, because I think the digital clock is it's not very meaningful for some users. But still, the principle is excellent. Um, this is a social story called Once Upon a Potty, about potty training. Um, I mean. There's a limit to how much technology might help you when you're trying to potty train a child, of course. But I, I suppose there's, you know, there's a lot of parents, at least, who say to me that you present something on a, on a screen and, and the children are just much more engaged with it than you come out with a paper book. Um, 
This is uh, a screenshot from an app called Bitsboard, which is superb. And it has a lot of information in it. Um, so it has boards for emotions, but also things like general knowledge. And within each category, there's a number of different games. So this is just a true or false game. Is this child proud, true, false? Um, but you can also play emotions bingo or emotions memory, you know, when you're turning over cards and have to match them together and so on. Just to show that I'm not completely about the iPad, that's from the Transporters uh, DVD. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't know how much that counts as technology because for me, one of the values of technology is that it's interactive, whereas that's just um, watching episodes. But it is a very good example of its kind. Okay, communication. I think we've got some speech and language therapists in the room, haven't we? So um, I'll try and get this bit right. Um, the positives of delivering um, communication devices through um, iPads and other tablets and so on is that um, you remove the social interactive elements. So a child who is reluctant to communicate because of anxiety around social interaction and so on may have um, skills in communicating through technology. There's um, anecdotal evidence, at least, that kids can learn by echoing. Um, slightly impaired, so I'm going to skip down to negatives by the fact that the um, digital voices in these apps don't necessarily model very good grammar and particularly not very good intonation. So given that we know already people with autism might have trouble with the kind of nuance and so on of, of language, that's not necessarily a great thing. But there's certainly strong evidence that if you can improve communicative opportunities for people with autism, that you can reduce um, challenging behaviours, and that's in everyone's uh, best interests. I have anxieties around using AAC um, uh, in this way with kids with autism, at least without thinking it through properly. In particular, I think that giving someone an app where you press a button and the app speaks the phrase, I want some juice, is in direct conflict with the principles of things like the Picture Exchange Communication System or the Hannon More Than Words program, which are all about emphasising the social interactive aspect of communication, the need to make a communicative link with a communication partner. Um, these apps were often designed in, with children with a physical barrier to speech in mind. So they were designed for children with cerebral palsy, for example. Um, uh, that it's, there's a risk that once you've gone down that route, you can't really stop. If, if a child or young person becomes dependent on an app as a form of communication, then it's very hard then to, to come back from that. And there are some very bad apps available. For example, this one is called Words on Wheels. I've never seen a more jumbled interface, <laughs> possible to interpret interface, um, particularly for a user with autism. Uh, Ditto here, these tiny buttons, completely incomprehensible symbols representing each word. And this one, which seems to have cut and pasted in images from each word based on what came up after a Google Images search or something. I mean, that's just... <laughs> so beware. This one costs you £200 for the app. This one is about £90 or something. I mean, really. So watch yourself. Two much better examples. This is Proloquo to go, which people might have come across. It's really the kind of um, uh, the, the commercial leader in this area. And it's very good, and it's got a lot of settings. It might be being replaced by this, which is called Acorn. Um, I haven't looked at it as much as I want to, but it's very, very clever because it learns the phrases someone regularly uses and rebuilds the configuration of the words on the screen according to commonly used phrases. So it's a learning app that learns the way the user wants to use it, which will kind of streamline that learning process. Um, you can also use things like PEX uh, on an app. And as I've mentioned earlier, they're much easier to carry around. And it's a doddle to create new symbols. Again, no more printing and laminating and running out of colored ink in the middle of the night and so on. The transition for kids from physical laminated Velcro on the back pecs to something on a phone screen could be challenging for some kids. Um, there are practical advantages to having it all in one place, but of course, if you lose your phone, you know, you've lost your pecs. Though it is at least backed up. And it's, it's more expensive, though not necessarily. I'll come back to that at the end. There are some great apps for this. This is called I Ask You. 
you build your phrase and then it prompts you to go and show someone and then the person that you're showing it so it doesn't have any audio you have to physically take your screen over to your communication partner and show it to them and then the communication partner can tap on yes or not available right now so you can build your response into the app as well and these are a couple of screenshots from an app called grace um, which was designed by a mother of a little girl with autism who had this enormous pex based vocabulary though wasn't speaking and her mother said surely i can get this put on my phone so i don't have to carry this all around It's called I Ask You. Um, anything, all of these apps are reviewed on the website or you can drop me a line afterwards and I will let you know. Education. Um, so here I'm thinking about literacy, numeracy, possibly general knowledge, things like that. So positives of using technology, it's a highly motivating learning environment. Kids are really keen to learn in this way. Um, they can control their learning pace. They're learning in a long social medium, so they have that freedom to learn without perhaps the anxiety that comes from learning um, in a classroom or, or from a teacher. And kids can be learning in an independent way, um, which frees up the rest of the family as well. The negatives are that it's only part of the picture um, and that you know you give a child an educational app that doesn't mean they're going to follow the intended learning route through that app but there are some great examples um, this is a screenshot from an app called Injini which is as you can see each one of these is a different game um, and within each game it has nine complexity levels so you get a huge amount um, for your uh, 9.99 or whatever it is and essentially these are all kind of executive function games you know they're kind of memory pattern matching <coughs> puzzle type games they're brilliant um, a couple of games here for budding linguists so at a basic level this is a game for um, letter and number recognition and learning sort of handwriting so you you know you f trace your finger around the R and a little train goes running around the the train track and so on and it's sort of implicitly scaffolded, so you start off with a lot of support to draw out your letter R, and it, it, it reduces as the game goes on. This is a brilliant game that my kids adore, where they have these wonderful um, long words, but using phonetic um, uh, letter sounds throughout. And you have to drag and drop your letters into the appropriate spaces. And when you're dragging them, so I'm going to do an impression now, this is going to embarrass me later. Anyway, you're dragging the G onto gargantuan and it goes, ga, 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 ga. And the kids love it and they um, echo it, but in a nice and productive manner. Um, it's really, really fun. And then at the end, you get a little cartoon animation of what gargantuan means as well. Um, this is an app that I put up because a lot of parents were talking about how their kids loved nursery rhymes and music and how could they turn that into something more productive. So each of these little robot guys represents um, a, a, a kind of note on a keyboard and you can learn to play nice nursery rhymes or you can make up your own nursery rhymes. It's very, very funny. If you hold your finger down on one robot for too long, he runs out of breath and goes <laughs> at the end. There's so much creativity in these games, it's amazing. Fun. Let's not forget about fun. Technology is really, really fun. Um, uh, there's a huge variety of things that you can put into a single um, tablet, phone, smartphone, device, desktop. Um, there's some great online games. So um, Busy Things is a fantastic website for online games for preschoolers. Um, there's built-in flexibility. I'll come back to this issue of kind of s obsessions and repetitive behaviours. But you can change apps around, you can take apps off, you can put new apps on and so on. Though there is a risk of obsession and those attempts to impose variety might not be successful. Um, I asked a mum recently how her son felt if the iPad wasn't available. I was interested in, you know, his kind of, um, how kind of... Uh, reliant he was on it being available what if it runs out of battery and she says no he's okay he understands that the ba battery and it has to go away and get plugged in he can have it back later he said but you know the other day actually i moved all his apps around and he was really cross and i thought my god if someone got hold of my phone and moved all my apps around i would be livid <laughs> the only way i know where they are is because they've always been there so i think it's worth bearing in mind if we want to impose variety uh, on um 
used with autism on their behalf. We need to be careful about how we do that. Interactivity is possible, and I'll highlight a couple of interactive games. But it must be said that a lot of technology use is quite solitary. Um, so here's a few examples of solitary games. Reacticals, I've mentioned before. This is by an app company, a development company called Duck Duck Moose. They do brilliant preschool games. I really recommend them. This is called Trucks. It's fantastic. It's got lots of trucks in it. Um, this is an app by a company called Hippotrix. It's called Hippo Seasons. It kind of teaches you a little bit about the seasons, but it's very sensory and interactive. And of course, you can get apps like Thomas the Tank Engine, like Peppa Pig, Dora the Explorer, you know, all of young kids' favourites. And thinking about this objection that technology isn't social, here are some examples of interactive games. So this um, is called Happy Geese. Essentially, they're board games. You can get the game of the goose and also snakes and ladders. You can see you have four players around the game. Um, you, they have little avatars. The game tells you whose turn it is to roll the die. Um, the game is scaffolded in such a way so you can start off with a color-coded, shape-coded die, and then you can move up to digits or the traditional dot arrangement and so on. Um, you start off where you roll the die and the square that you're supposed to be moving to will flash and your little avatar will flash, but you can start to scaffold these, those things down. So unlike with a real board game, you have all of this structure built in. And I think the potential for learning skills like turn taking and so on are, are, are fantastic with games like this. The basic version of this is free. This is a game called Sneak. It's absolutely wonderful. You put your iPad or iPhone or whatever it is somewhere and a black screen comes up and you all have to go and hide around the room and then a monster comes on to eat the bait that you have left on the screen of the iPad and you have to sneak up on the monster and touch the iPad screen without him noticing and if he hears you coming or if he sees you using the iPad camera and microphone then he will run away. How cool is that? And then this is just, um, these are some of the, the social um, uh, kind of online fora available um, online. So, you know, MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, Friendster, all of these sorts of things. And this is just, this is just a sample of the many ways in which we can interact socially online. Okay, I'm coming to the end, about five more minutes, I think. So I just want to say something about managing technology, particularly in the light of paediatric advice on screen time. Um, so this is a headline from The Guardian Online. Ban under threes from watching television, says study. This headline should read, Ban under threes from watching television, says man with no qualifications to say this. <laughs> there is not evidence to support that. Um, in fact, the latest evidence... Oh, yes, hang on. This is a quote from the American... The Academy of Pediatrics... American Academy of Pediatrics that says that media have potentially negative effects and no known positive effects for children younger than two years. Which, if you translate it, means we think it might be bad for them and no one's definitely shown it's good for them. Which is pretty weak, if you ask me. If that's the best they can come up with. <coughs> if you look at some real evidence, um, this systematic review of 15 studies using iPods, iPod touches and iPads with kids with developmental disabilities found that they were positive and viable technological aids with children producing um, improvements in the targeted outcomes. My own review of 83 studies, all with people with autism of all ages, found overwhelmingly positive outcomes. There is, ne there is evidence of participant dropout. It's not for everyone. Um, Parks study, this is a study from the Millennium Cohort, so this is 11,000 children. They found no relationship between screen time at five years old and outcome at seven years old, including attention, hyperactivity, school attainment or pro-social behaviour. So it's probably fine. Um, I'm going to skip this because I feel like I've been wittering on for too long. Thinking about obsessive behaviour, so this is specific to thinking about working with users with autism, introducing new technological aids and getting it right from the beginning. Um, so I think it's very important to have a plan in your head. Um, thinking about using routine to your advantage, so when are we going to get the iPad out, when are we going to use it, specific times of day, as a treat after doing things and so on. Um, 
you can delete and reinstall apps to promote flexibility so the child always has something fun to play with but it's not necessarily the same thing every day or the same thing for you know a six month period lots of parents have talked about how they use the battery so they intentionally allow the battery to run down and oh no no battery oh it'll be a couple of days before it's charged up again <laughs> works brilliantly um, you can create folders to organise your apps. The child won't necessarily respect them and they might move them all around, but you can give it a go. Parents I've spoken to have also used colour-coded cases. So a green case for playtime and a red case for sitting down and working, for example. Um, I'm going to skip this as well. So what to look for? Things to think about when you're choosing... Um, technology, thinking about purchasing technology, recommending technology, if you've got parents asking you what they should buy. Think about the hardware and think about what you want it to do. So this talk has been very iPad biased, but there is an enormous amount more available for iPads and iPhones than there is for anything else. So even though other tablets are cheaper and therefore easier to get hold of, there isn't the same choice when it comes to actually selecting apps. There is a Samsung tab tablet that's completely waterproof. I can't remember the name of it, but you can drop it in the bath and it still works. For some users, that could be a really relevant feature. Um, you can get some wonderful cases. These are called the iGuy. They're only about $6.99 on Amazon. They've got these lovely big handles and you can stand the iPad up and they're brilliant and they're really very tough and rubbery if the iPad gets chucked or dropped. If you have or working with someone who is likely to really hurl the iPad across the room or otherwise mistreat it, then you can't beat an Otterbox. They're about £60 for an iPad or about 30 for an iPhone case, but they are very, very tough. I think the military use them. They make it quite heavy. That's not necessarily a bad thing, actually. The child has to sit down at the table in order to use the game rather than wandering around all over the place. Think about the interface. What do you want the technology for? So... If you want your child to have the opportunity to burn off some energy without constantly having to take them out of the park or other stressful environments, then maybe something like a Wii is more appropriate or a Connect that's encouraging your child to get up and move around and burn some energy off. Um, think about when you're choosing software or indeed hardware, but particularly software, is there evidence that the, the developers have consulted with parents or practitioners or teachers? Have they done, have they, if they're making therapeutic claims, is there evidence to back up those therapeutic claims? Have they worked with a university or someone else independent to evaluate their technology? Face validity just means, uh, does it do what you want it to do? So you know your child or your client group or your um, whoever it is you're working with, and you know what their learning needs are. You know, you're thinking, well, this year we're going to try and work on letter recognition, so that's what you're looking for. Don't be tempted to get things just because they say they're for autism. They're not necessarily automatically relevant for whoever you're working with. Personalization features are really, really important. Can you select your own rewards? Can you embed rewards into it? Um, so, you know, if, if you have a child with a specific interest in different types of Hoover nozzle, can you drop in photographs of different types of Hoover, Hoover nozzle as their rewards going through the game? And then they're going to be much more motivated to play than if they get a gold star or something equally meaningless to them. Think about budget. So I touched on this earlier. Um, I know when I'm sitting here talking about iPads and iPhones and people are thinking, well, I'm sorry, I don't have 500 quid in my back pocket going begging. But you can get now an old iPhone for, actually, nowadays, I, I checked this just before Christmas, it's more like a tenner, really, for the most basic version. But you don't need it to have a signal anymore. You don't need to get a contract or a SIM card for it. You buy one on eBay, you get a decent case, and you download all the games you want onto it. And, it and it's brilliant. There's also an accessibility setting. I just discovered this recently. Um, so if the button isn't working very well, which is one of the first things to go on a second-hand iPhone, you can create a kind of fake button that hovers around on the screen and can be dragged to wherever you want it to go. So you don't even need the physical button to work. Um, so hopefully all of these things suggest that that perhaps some of the stuff I was talking about that didn't seem so relevant might be more relevant after all, because these things are a little bit more accessible than, than, than people think they are. 
Right, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope that that was what you were expecting to hear me talk about and that it may prove a little bit useful. Thank you.